Hi friends, welcome to the NPTEL course Strategy and Technology, a Practical Primer. In this week, we have the theme of Competitive Strategy continuing. In this lecture, which is the 19th in this series, we will discuss the Six Forces model. When I say Six Forces, I don't mean only the forces of competition. We also propose a Six Forces model of collaboration as well in this lecture. We are all moving from competition to collaboration in varying degrees. Porter's theory advocates competition as the bedrock of strategy. However, this lecture proposes sustainable collaboration as a driver of positive competition. Firms and industries are more networked than ever. They are collaborating effectively at component level even while competing intensely at the product level. Why is it happening? It is happening because of design specialization, that is product specialization on one hand and market specialization, that is customer specialization on the other hand. This exemplifies the new industrial structure. It is therefore appropriate to supplement, if not substitute, the six forces of competition with a model of six collaborative forces which is relevant to the times. Competition must certainly exist, but it should be more in the nature of product, process and delivery innovation. Collaboration helps firms share resources while retaining a distinct identity. In my view, collaboration has the potential and the wherewithal to reduce needless stress levels in the industry and promote greater viability at the industry level and even at the firm level. Strategic leadership must therefore be wise and visionary to get a deft balance between competition and collaboration. The typical competitive approach is as follows. It as a goal looks at overcoming the other firm and any development of one firm is seen to be at the cost of others, including its own vendors and channel partners. And the whole idea is to win the game of competition, the lowest possible cost, the highest possible prices, no entrants, no substitute products, no industry rivalry, etc. That's the typical competitive approach. And companies adopt aggressive strategies to be able to do that, build scale and scope, therefore erect entry barriers, counter the suppliers and distributors at times through integration or through bargaining power, acquire businesses and products and become large. These are the typical competitive strategies that are adopted. These strategies all investment intensive are conceptualized and executed typically during boom times and may cause stress under tough times. Also, these are financed by combinations of debt and equity depending upon the nature of the company and the industry. As we are aware, several Indian companies acquired overseas assets using these competitive strategies, but they had to face difficulties as a result of the meltdown of 2018. The businesses had to wait out for years to recover from the stress of investment and lack of viability. Example, Tata Group's overseas acquisitions. Tata Steel had to wait for nearly a decade to be able to see light at the end of the tunnel with the chorus acquisition. It is not necessary that all companies must follow the standardized principles of industry definition, industry structure and competitive formulations which are all grounded in competition. The core of success lies in technological strength and strategic intent of a company independent of the business model. Let's look at the competitive models of three companies. Tata Motors pursued an aggressive product diversification strategy with scale and scope in all types of commercial vehicles, light, medium and heavy, as well as passengers, cars and SUVs. This is the broadest strategy adopted ever by an Indian automobile firm. Ashok Leyland pursued broad focus. It was focused in commercial vehicle business, but it also had a broader focus, that is specialization in medium and heavy commercial vehicles and meaningful diversification into lighter vehicles and more of scale and scope in each segment. Mahindra maintained a sharp focus on light vehicles with scale, Jeeps to start with and then SUVs later and to some extent LCVs derived from Jeep kind of models. Tactical forays into medium commercial vehicles were considered from time to time, but they were not successful. So these are the three competitive models adopted by three big and successful companies in the Indian automobile industry. 
Over time, Ashok Leyland became the bellwether of the commercial vehicle industry. While Tata Motors struggled with the challenges of driving successfully multiple product groups under one corporate umbrella, Mahindra also similarly struggled with the challenges of multiple product groups. However, all the three companies have been successful to varying degrees. So the competitive model creates its own stress when you try to do it all by yourself. But competition is there always. We cannot progress without competition. As Charles Darwin hypothesized, humans are governed by the survival of the fittest dictum, a concept which I covered earlier also. Corporations, as the new icons of progress of civilization, also reflect this dictum, and unfortunately to an even greater degree. Although more than 30 years have passed since appearing on the strategy scene, Porter's theories of competition dictate management thought in the strategy domain. Quite apart from the need to incorporate economic factors, which I discussed in the previous lectures, two major inadequacies need to be addressed in the Porter's theory. One, generic strategies are now well understood by all and remain applicable to the universe of corporations. Focused execution rather than strategy formulation per se determines relative success among corporations. Secondly, in a resource-constrained economic situation, emphasis on fiery competition, aggressive strategies and uh, cutthroat uh, competitive moves together consume continuous investments by all players and they become self-defeating over time, particularly as I said for resource-constrained, resource-scarce economies. So while broad strategy, focused execution are important, the strategy formulation has to be linked to the scarcity or abundance of resources that we have. So the question of strategy must be resource optimization even while competing. Everybody likes competition, which is one of the reasons why Porter's theories have become successful. Because everybody wants to compete, everybody wants to win. It appeals to the inherent human nature. But we need to look at the industry and the firm in a more positive approach. Emerging markets particularly require a different paradigm which this lecture proposes. The forces of competition have been talked about earlier. These are the threat of new competition or the threat of entry, threat of substitute products or services, bargaining power of customers, bias, bargaining power of suppliers and intensity of competitive rivalry. Add to that, as I said in the economic uh, theories, of the past lectures, global liquidity as the sixth economic force that needs to be supplementing the industrial forces. The whole competitive theory framework brims with the spirit of competition, with the drive of competition, wherein each stakeholder is constantly jockeying to get the better of a relationship, strategic or tactical. In a sense, I would believe that the Five Forces theory of Potter corresponds to the theory X of organizational behavior. It brings out the negative nuances of corporate growth and economic development. Over the last three decades, industry environment and technological attributes have changed so dramatically that the traditional, including Potter's view of firms and industries as being consistently at each other's throat, needed to be jettisoned. It is no longer valid. The Potter model clearly needs to be redefined to meet new environmental requirements in terms of collaboration rather than only competition. A model of collaborative competition is very much in order. This is also supported by the fact that industries and firms are more networked than ever. Firms are communicating with their stakeholders through social networking sites such as Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, WhatsApp and Twitter which are now developing applications for smart devices and computers made by others. The launch of Apple iPhone and Apple Watch saw Apple collaborating with leading gaming and fitness companies and Apple is also collaborating with many healthcare companies to be able to make the watch a true health companion. These are the visible examples of networked firms collaborating across industries to develop certain business and customer service jointly. The scenario of a few operating systems supporting a very wide variety and range of cellular phones 
no longer smacks of monopoly domination. If a company can do the OS the best possible manner, let that company do and support all the other devices. Instead, this move towards standardization of certain components or systems across a range of devices points to a move to enhance aggregate business potential by enabling other businesses work on certain other things where they have core competencies. So individual core competencies are sought to be maximized rather than all aggrandized to themselves. Nothing illustrates this better than Microsoft releasing its productivity suites to all devices. Today search engines, navigation systems and electronics manufacturers support a mechanical equipment industry such as automobile industry like never before. The use of electronics in automobiles has improved user luxury and comfort in addition to safety and convenience. The cars currently contain more than 1000 electronic components. Without electronics and semiconductors, the modern automobile cannot be manufactured. With electric and autonomous driving on the anvil, the trend of automotive digitization will only increase further, which means technology firms and automobile firms need to collaborate with each other far more than they have ever done. Another example of networked industries and firms. Along with specialization and competition came the need for firms to diversify their market base to sustain economics. Therefore, cross-industry spread of applications is a very much desirable collaborative trend. We can take two examples. A specialist company in forgings for commercial vehicles needs an expanded market base, forging parts for giant ships as well as small scooters, forging parts for defense applications as well as for civilian applications. Similarly, end product manufacturers need to concentrate only on certain core competencies for themselves, leveraging other core competencies to fill, finish or complete the products. At the same time, the way product profiles and customer needs are matched has also diversified. We can see convergence taking place, that is, many needs getting fulfilled by one device, specialization taking place, that is, one device being applicable for a predominant need, redundancy, many devices being applicable for one need, diversity, many needs and many products. So, Convergence, specialization, redundancy, and diversity. These are characteristic development of products in the current milieu. And these strategies, these occurrences are not exclusive of each other. Select combinations are also possible based on creativity and innovation. Let us look at something more of networked industries and firms. Device functionality trends are prompting firms to develop their own networking strategies so that they can share resources and optimize tactics in the context of continuously changing customer dynamics. Devices we can classify as being one or many. Functionality we can classify as being one or many. When you have one device with one functionality, we can say that the device is completely specialized. But you have many devices but only one functionality, we can say that redundancy is operating in that device group. If you have one device which meets many requirements, then we have convergence. A typical example is the phone, cellular phone. On the other hand, if you have many devices meeting many applications, it is diversity. So automobile industry with their diversified product range, which will take care of several applications in several sectors of the industry and civilian usage reflects diversity. A product such as lift which is also a stair lift, tries to meet one functionality of upward movement with several devices, that is redundancy. An integrated circuit, a semiconductor, which powers many devices, is a case of one device but one functionality only, that is internal processing. So the many devices it powers is only an apparent issue. The real use of that chip is to support the processing. We have one device but meeting many requirements as I said in the case of modern cellular phone. In the current industrial environment, competition therefore needs to be tempered with collaboration. A strategic theory that redefines the forces governing the industry in terms of collaboration is very much needed. What does it do? It understands the systemic economic benefits of collaboration. 
it shows this as an appropriate dimension in formulation of competitive strategy. Competitive strategy gets built not only on the foundation of competition, but also on the basis of collaboration. It sets up collaboration between different industries to be able to provide more synergized output for the benefit of customers. The six forces of collaboration are as follows. One, competition driven market expansion, which is a given because more products and more services lead to better customer usage of those products and services. Therefore, the pie expands for everybody. Whenever we have substitute products or services, they need not be only competitive. They could be collaborative as well. When you have a cellular phone coming in, it doesn't mean that it obviates the need for a desktop. If you have WhatsApp on your cellular phone, it doesn't mean that communication through that medium, through desktop, is negated is still possible therefore substitute products and services can add to the collaborative power rather than reduce collaborative power of customers and buyers that is co-experiencing the product by the firm as well as the customer could lead to better design of products and better delivery of the products collaborative power of suppliers amongst various forces of collaboration this has been there for uh, some years particularly reinforced by Japanese experience. If the component makers and the end product makers start developing a product or component simultaneously, the development would be much more perfect with better time to market, faster go to market by the end product makers. And there should be a balance of collaborative synergy and competitive rivalry. When that happens, there will be instead of rivalry, you will have network synergy. There would be economic synergy that comes up through the collaborative method. These are the six forces of collaboration. The collaborative model differs from the competitive model on a few important dimensions. It sees competition as less of an unsettling force and it sees that as more of a market expansion approach. It views new, new products as a bundling opportunity for existing products and not as transition to substitution and obsolescence. It sees new products as a transition to enhanced customer experience. It also views customers and suppliers as being collaborative with the firm and amongst themselves rather than being combative with the firm. Finally, it also proposes that collaboration and competition can coexist in a firm and the balance between these two forces will determine the growth energy and sustainability of the industry as a whole. This is the essence of the six forces model of collaboration. Let's look at the two different aspects. The competitive model, if we absorb and execute in total, that is everybody being at the throat of everybody to win over the other, then it will only encourage us to define the industry in very narrow terms. We will define the industry in terms of the minute micro segments. For example, for automobile industry in respect of car, truck, bus and two-wheeler on the basis that each product is not a substitute for the other and each represents an independent industrial segment. On the other hand, if you think of collaborative model, for the same industry, we may consider all passenger serving segments as a holistic segment. That is, all mobility applications of passengers as a holistic one, including not only traditional automobile segments such as car, bus and two-wheeler, but also supportive industries such as navigation, image capture, electronics, telecommunication and entertainment. Therefore, you can see the industry canvas suddenly widening, not only within the automobile industry, but outside the automobile industry as well. Over and above that, content developers, content makers, content distributors are no longer seen as distinct silos. They will all be seen as one collaborative network. This approach of collaboration, seeing a firm, a company, its products, an industry and its product groups in a 360 degree expansive uh, way will lead to complexity of analysis, no doubt, because collaboration can be boundless. But it also ensures that we get the best out of the industrial developments that are happening. So we have to move 
as strategists from the very simple narrow models of competition and get into more complex but more beneficial models of collaboration. The competitive collaboration model in my view is already a reality. Complex integration of multiple technologies and platforms is taking place for better functionality as well as customer satisfaction. And this can be achieved more proficiently and effectively only with collaboration. The six forces of collaboration are illustrated further here. They together act on the economic synergy. Collaborative power of competition led market expansion, synergy of substitute products or services, collaborative power of customers bias, collaborative power of suppliers, balance of collaborative synergy and competitive rivalry. It may be seen to be taking some cues from the competitive forces. When we talk about threat of new entrants, we are talking about the competitive force of entry. But we are tweaking it to say that there is a collaborative power of competition-led market expansion because companies can collaborate as they try to add new products, as they try to enter new segments. We are saying that substitute products or services are not threats, but they can provide synergy to the existing products as well as other adjunct products. Similarly, buyers and firms can coexist and co-develop, co-create value, we are saying. Supplier's collaborative power is well understood and it could add to synergy of both the firm and the component maker. And we are saying that competitive rivalry cannot be zero. There will be competitive rivalry, but that has to be balanced by collaborative synergy, we are saying. As a result of this, we will have a virtuous network which is characterized not by endless industry rivalry, but is characterized by boundless economic synergy. This is the essence of the six collaborative forces model. How do we define each of these factors? Let's look at first the competition-led market expansion. When new competition occurs, the industry scenario of well-balanced players only serves to expand the market because that competition is enabled by collaborative support extended by downstream and upstream players. If there is an industry and if there are channels to distribute products, availability of those channels definitely helps a newcomer to expand the market successfully. In India, the entry of new automobile players helped the market grow exponentially from 500,000 cars per year in the, in the Maruti Suzuki solo days that existed in late 1990s to around 3 million cars in 2016. By the same token, the entry of luxury car makers such as Benz, Audi and BMW saw the Indian luxury car market grow to 30,000 from next to nothing in just 5 years. So entry of new cars has led to expansion of the market but that was feasible because the both the channels and the customers as well as the component makers supported that expansion. Global smartphone sales galloped to 1 billion units in just 10 years, again from next to nothing, based essentially on entry of several smartphone makers in a market amazingly opened up by Apple. The entry of Patanjali with its complete range of Ayurvedic products is opening up a completely new FMCG segment that is expanding the overall market for personal care products in India. Therefore, new competitors do offer an unmitigated gift of market expansion to consumers and incumbent players. Without Patanjali entering the market, Hindustan Lever and Colgate would not have brought in their own Ayurvedic products. Dabur and Himalaya would not have been able to reinvent their Ayurvedic products and put them into the market. While Patanjali's entry may be seen as competition, it is also a veiled collaboration that has happened and it has led to market expansion. Even an innovator firm cannot fulfill total market demand in spite of the monopoly position. So what is wrong in new entry if that is expanding the overall market? In an innovative product market segment such as fitness bands for example, the pioneer Fitbit saw the market expand enormously with the entry of Apple Watch. The technological superiority of Apple Watch of course led Fitbit to decline in its sales. However, it has also spurred Fitbit to expand its uh, range. Fitbit came up with its own uh, digital uh, health ecosystem as well as a digital watch. Therefore, viewing any move as competition or collaboration is a mindset issue as well. 
Let us look at the synergy of substitute products or services. These are considered in the competitive theory to be threats to existing businesses. On the other hand, these offer synergy across products and product groups. Except in the cases such as Telex, routing out dot matrix printer, it is extremely unusual for certain basic product concepts to be completely threatened or obliterated. For example, we always will need a chair and a table. We always need a brushing system. We always need a commuting system and so on. For example, once the only dominant computing system, the mainframe computer was progressively supplemented by personal computer, laptop, notebook, netbook, tablet, ultrabook, you name it, we have it. Yet, all these computing devices, including the mainframe computer, exist in some form or another even today each gaining from the other's competencies. You may find a huge mainframe computer supporting a space program, but you will also see many people working with their desktops, their laptops, interacting with the mainframe computer as well as the space shuttle. So that is the kind of uh, togetherness that has come about through substitute products. Except for a few predominantly mechanical apparatuses, as I said of telex and dot matrix printer, it is unusual for certain basic product concepts to be completely threatened or obliterated. That is the fact of life. In fact, substitute products help incumbents who are either innovators or smart followers to diversify their product market segments. Ultrabook is an example of how computers could reinvent themselves by taking design cues from later generation tablets. The broader ecosystem these days is keen to support customized differentiation based on collaboration. How does the collaborative power of customers, that is the buyers, help? Firms and industry exit for customers. It is therefore ironic to think, as the competitive theory proposes, that customers are a competitive force. Yes, customers do want better quality at lower price. It doesn't mean that customers are competing with the company and that company needs to browbeat the customers into acceptance of company's products and services. Customer is the king. Customer demands do not represent competition. Customer demand, no doubt, leads to competitive entry by other firms or consumers because if the existing incumbent firms are not able to meet the customer demand, it is a fertile field for other companies to enter with better products and better services. This in turn causes switching between products, brands and firms. In this manner, customers do have a competitive impact. However, failure to recognize and cater to customer requirements will lead to product and business atrophy. The predominant bond between firms and consumers has therefore to be one of collaboration. Consumers simply love a great product and collaborate with the firm by patronizing successive generations of products. Every firm must therefore try to seek perfection, stability and sustainability in the relationship between the customers and the firm. Firms which view consumers as an extended family through a variety of feedback and feedforward mechanisms could see the consumers providing a major collaborative force for the firms in terms of product uh, ideas, in terms of business models, in terms of strategic expansion and technological development. The release of beta versions of new software for consumers is an example of how firms can bring buyers uh, potential uh, suggestions into the products so that the ultimate product meets the requirements of a wider range of customers with greater uh, probability of success. So collaboration through alpha testing and beta testing has been uh, one of the mainstays of proper software development and uh, equipment development. Let's look at the power of suppliers. The notion that end product manufacturers are at the mercy of suppliers or that the suppliers is at the mercy of end product manufacturers you know, is no longer relevant. There are mutual technological and supply strengths and there are different markets for different uh, groups. Component makers can become truly global and they could be supplying to many businesses whereas end product makers can take products from different types of uh, suppliers. So this kind of mutuality has become broader. That doesn't mean that there should be collaborative power lacking in any manner. 
Specialization in materials and component technologies has enabled component makers to lead new product development. So there must be collaborative power between suppliers and the end product makers. If somebody is able to integrate sensors in their uh, new product development, there must be collaboration between the end product maker and the sensor developer. Smartphone makers are increasingly setting up pre-release collaborations with application developers for the right ecosystem. This is a great example. Collaborative planning also emphasizes an approach by which suppliers and firms are working together to avoid over or underbidding of positions. And instead, they maximize the end product opportunities in the marketplace with the right products, right pricing and right volumes. Developing of autonomy software for autonomous vehicles is reflective of the collaborative power of the autonomous car manufacturers and high-end technology companies. Bilateral collaboration between one end product manufacturer and each component maker needs to be elevated to a collaborative network that includes everyone in the system. So it is a huge network of collaborative partners. While two faces may be evident, but each face is supported by several other uh, limbs of the overall ecosystem. The balance of collaborative and competitive rivalry is the collaborative force that would strengthen the synergy. Porter's model assumes that competitive rivalry in an industry increases as the fifth force with the number of firms in the industry and the intensity of other competitive forces enhancing the rivalry. That is, the more the number of players in an industry, the more will be the competitive rivalry in the industry. However, it is quite possible that some of the firms in the industry could collaborate even while competing in the marketplace. Sharing production sites, utilizing R&D facilities, sharing marketing channels, warehousing and ground handling facilities, co-branding and co-marketing, exchanging components and cross-licensing intellectual property among others help firms pool resources while keeping individual identities discreet. There is no reason why an airliner which only has 10 uh, flights to an airport should have all the systems from ground handling to passenger embarking and disembarking all by its own brand, its own uh, facilities and its own uh, logos. We can share uh, those facilities. So sharing of assets which are not rigorously used all the time helps partners collaborate with each other. Such collaboration also helps companies bring down costs. An equitable balance of course is required between collaboration and competition in industry as the industry rapidly revolves. One of the ways is to say that okay, I am using a spicejet ladder but when I am using that for indigo requirements, I have a way in which I brand indigo also in that or I will substitute the spicejet branding by indigo. By having a collaborative approach, the same product can be utilized by two different uh, vendors or two different uh, customer facing entities in a productive manner without in any manner upsetting the individual brand equity. So what is the network of economic synergy? Collaboration does not occur by happenstance. It is a result of a leadership mindset that recognizes the positive behavior of the five forces that generate an economic synergy in the network. So we have to as leaders create a firm that will strive to create an ecosystem that adopts to the following. One, markets that are expanded by new entrants, markets that utilize new substitute products, an industrial system that develops customer-centric relationships, a system which partners with suppliers for shared growth, and one which respects collaborative competition. These are the hallmarks of a collaborative ecosystem. A firm that assiduously avoids markets that are opened by new entrants runs the risk of steadfastly refusing to understand the relevance of substitute products. That is, if you say that the new market opened by a new company is not relevant for me, I will continue to be strong in my own area that is going to be at the peril of the company. Similarly, if a firm concentrates on different groups of buyers for such buying, if it toggles between different suppliers for uh, procurement savings, that is, this year I will have this vendor, next year I will try to force that vendor against another vendor, try to get cost savings. That is the one which will reduce costs, but it also makes collaboration a distant reality. 
and such firms do not understand the relative merits of collaboration unfortunately competition generates far less economic synergy in fact it generates negative economic power relative to a firm that acts positively on all these fronts as such collaboration generates a framework of economic synergy with a positive collaborative force in the ecosystem by no means it says that product makers do not compete in the open market by their own brands and by their own efforts but whatever could be shared amongst themselves whatever could be used for collaboration will be used as part of this collaborative model to be able to move from competition to collaboration to take the hand of somebody else we have to have certain mind shift changes the hypothesis primarily is that all corporate strategy need not be and it should not be comprised only of a strategy of competition point number 1 competition must exist because that is the way we serve the customers better but it must be more in the nature of product process and delivery innovation or differentiation the strategy alone of collaboration or of competition cannot delight customers and expand markets the strategy that combines both collaboration and competition alone delights customers and expands markets however it requires significant investments particularly in terms of leadership collaboration this model of collaborative strategy can help firms optimize their investments by sharing resources while retaining a distinct identity firms can also derive synergy by looking for areas of collaboration with their stakeholders be they customers or suppliers and their competitors whether they are followers in an existing product line or innovators of a new substitute product and service we can also look for collaborations in entirely new fields as well as new methods in the wake of demonetization in india collaborative arrangements between the formal sector and informal sector started beginning to take place these have helped uh, informal uh, companies become more competent in terms of meeting the needs of several other uh, uh, customers so digital payment services have rendered higher connectivity possible even for the smallest of small firms so opportunities are utilized and challenges are overcome when certain uh, collaborative approach is taken by sectors which are seen to be independent of each other in the past continuing this the theme of competition to collaboration we can also conclude that while the model of six collaborative forces as in stated here has significant validity it is open to further study if it can be followed up with generic collaborative strategies on the lines of generic competitive strategy that is just as we had three generic competitive strategies of cost leadership product differentiation or service differentiation and niche can we have similarly generic collaborative strategies this is a question which we need to look at so we have cost leadership product differentiation niche so the corresponding collaborative strategy could be product collaboration process collaboration and marketing collaboration the differentiators for each firm despite the collaborative sharing will be design uniqueness operational excellence and delivery efficiency this is one model of moving from competition to collaboration uniqueness when it is created by two forces joining together in an entirely different field could be even more synergistic when a pharmaceutical company such as gsk combines with a technology company such as alphabet to collaborate in the development of uh, smart glasses or more bioelectronics products then it could lead to synergy that was never anticipated individually by the companies so it requires also a leadership mindset to combine the capabilities competencies and the visions of two independent companies so with this we come to the end of this lecture we'll meet again in the next lecture thank you